All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Allison Brunswick. I am an undergraduate bioengineering student at the University of Pittsburgh. And for the past year, I've been working at the Human Engineering Research Labs here in Pittsburgh. Um, one of the studies that I've been focused on is about the effectiveness of in-wheel suspension in reducing the vibration and shock um, that manual wheelchair users experience. So we can get started. Um, I first want to say there is no conflict of interest to report, and then that's the grant that gave us our funding for the project. Some background on these um, vibrations that I was referencing. Um, these whole body vibrations are like everyone experiences them in a car when you're sitting, um, but manual wheelchair users, and I guess wheelchair users in general, experience them every time they propel, every time they go over a different surface. Um, these different textures are unavoidable. They are unexpected often, they're inconsistent, they change everywhere you go. And as you can see, they're present indoors and outdoors. Um, think like door thresholds, any type of bump on the sidewalk, um, potholes, gravel, grass, any type of those surfaces will cause a different whole body vibration. So these whole body vibrations, um, the reason why we wanna reduce this is because excessive vibrations can lead to an increasing in neck and back pain which um, manual wheelchair users often already have neck and back pain. So we wanna make sure that's not increasing. And um, the health guidance caution zones from ISO 2631, that chart right there is showing the different um, safety levels of exposure to vibration. And that X axis is the time and the Y is the acceleration experience. So as you can see, the less time you're exposed to the vibration, the higher those levels can be in the um, safe zone. So we're gonna be referencing um, the 10 minute time zone um, just for the purposes of this study. So it'll be those values that we'll talk about in a little bit. So a little bit more background on the suspension aspect of the study. Um, In-frame suspension for manual wheelchair users has been around for quite a while, um, but that often requires the purchase of a brand new frame and it only attenuates one directional shocks. So um, kind of a novel technology is in-wheel suspension. Um, these can be made with springs or carbon fiber aspects. Um, the wheel I have pictured right here is a loop wheel. Um, it's one of the wheels that we're going to be using in this study. And as you can see, it uses these carbon fiber springs um, and the spokes are more like blades to attenuate those multi-directional shocks. Um, and also these wheels can retrofit onto um, a wheelchair's frame, that, wheelchair user's frame that they already have. As long as it has a quick release axle, they can just pop it on and off. Um, however, because these are so new, the effects of the in-wheel suspension methods um, is limited. There are other studies looking into it as well. Um, so we'll get into what we did with the wheelchairs. Um, the objective of our study was to compare the effects of the novel in-wheel suspension method, which is the loop wheel we just saw, to a lightweight carbon fiber-based wheel, which is a Spinergy CLX wheel, and then a standard spoked wheel. Um, we want to see how they attenuate these shocks and vibrations during wheelchair propulsion. And we hypothesize that the loop wheel and the Spinergy CLX wheel will have a lower root mean squared and vibrational dose value um, than the standard spoked wheel during our trials. And we're going to be using our repeated measures ANOVA hypothesis at a 95% confidence level. Some of the participants that we've recruited so far, um, this is our inclusion criteria. I just want to touch on a couple of those. Um, we wanted to make sure that they've been using their manual chair for at least 12 months, so they have some experience. Um, they needed to have a 24 inch diameter quick release wheel just to make sure that the loop wheels and the Spinergy CLX um, are similar to the wheels that they're already using. They cannot have a suspension frame, and then they must have some moderate chronic neck or back pain because we want to see how these wheels change that level of pain that they experience. And this is the demographics of our participants so far. Um, as you see, nine male, three female, um, the age average around 43 years, um, standard devi deviation of 10, um, the weight, as you can see, and then our wheelchair experience um, had a, quite a large standard deviation, which is good. So we can see how the different levels of experience may affect the opinion of these wheels. So moving into the data collection, um, the participants were using these three wheel types on a mobility course in lab, which I'll show you in just a moment. Um, and they do three trials per wheel type. So that's nine total um, plus one practice run. Um, during these trials, they have three sensors attached on their wheelchair. As you can see on the image, there's one on the backrest, one on the seat plate, and one on the footrest. 
And these sensors are a Shimmer 3 inertial measurement unit, or IMU. That's that little picture down on the bottom. And that collects at 100 hertz, and we're using that to collect the accelerometer data. We also have a little bit of more qualitative data collection with some surveys. We first have a visual analog scale that goes from 0 to 10, and the uh, participants use that to rate the comfort over each obstacle that we have on our mobility course. And then there's also a Likert scale going from um, one being not at all and five being extremely. So those questions are regarding um, how secure they felt, um, their ability to maneuver, their pushroom comfort, their overall body comfort while using the wheels, and then their efficiency when propelling. So here's a picture of those three different wheels I was talking about. We have the standard spoke wheel, the Spinergy CLX, which has a lightweight carbon fiber rim, and then the loop wheels urban that we saw earlier. Um, during the in-lab portion, the order of the wheel type is randomized, so every participant is using a different one in a different order. And the participants are also blinded to what wheel type they're using during the trials using a fabric cover on the spokes so that way they can't really see which wheel they're using um, to avoid any bias when they're filling out those surveys. And then each of these wheels has the same tires on it, all air filled, and we all we check all of the pressures in them before each of the trial to ensure that that's not differing. So that mobility course I referenced um, is different textured surfaces. They all generate different vibrations. Um, we split it into groups of three by intensity. So there's a low, moderate, and high intensity sections. And as I said, they have at least one practice run. They can have more if they would like with um, three trials per wheel type. So at minimum, that's 10 trials. And they're doing this at a self-selected pace. Um, we want this to be consistent. So that way their speed isn't a factor. And then we don't want them rushing through because we wanna make sure everyone is safe when they're completing this mobility course. So here's the pictures of those different obstacles. Um, for our low intensity section, we have a high pile carpet, a low pile carpet, and a rubber mat. For the moderate, we have um, a flat board, we have a speed bump and a foam board. And then for our high intensity section, we have a ramp with a four inch curb drop and then a gravel board. And each of these um, obstacles was either made or something that we already had in lab. So after we collect all this data for that in-lab portion, we move into the data processing. Um, those IMU sensors, we need to rotate the axes to gravity using a rotation matrix. Um, this is because every wheelchair is slightly different. So when we're attaching these sensors to the different positions, they're not always completely straight up and have one axis in the vertical perfect. So we use that rotation matrix. Um, and to do that, we collect five seconds of a static pose before each trial, just to make sure we can orient those sensors when we go to evaluate later. So then we follow um, ISO 2631 in um, applying the bandpass filter, then the acceleration to velocity transition, and finally the upward step to get that frequency weighted acceleration from the raw data that we have collected. So after um, getting that frequency weighted acceleration, we use that to um, calculate some whole body vibration values um, that follow those health guidance caution zones we saw earlier. So the RMS or root mean squared is sensitive to our high frequency, low amplitude acceleration. Think um, going over a carpet, uh, going over uh, different sidewalks, things like that. And the VDV or the vibrational dose value is sensitive to our low frequency and high amplitude acceleration peaks, more like um, going over a bump or going off a curb, something like that. Um, the health guidance caution zones, um, again, we're gonna be using the values from short-term vibration. Um, these are for 10 minutes of exposure. However, the trials only last a few minutes at most, but if you were to apply these few minutes that they are doing the mobility course to an entire day, it can be assumed they probably get about 10 minutes of exposure. So those values are going to be um, for RMS 0.43 to 0.86 meters per second squared, and then for VDV 8.5 to 17 meters per second to the 1.75. And on the next side, we have those values. Don't worry, I'll have a zoomed in version of these charts coming up for you. But this just shows that in our um, VDV values, we are not quite reaching those health guidance caution zones. However, for the RMS, um, for almost every sensor position and low, medium, and high, except for that one um, seat panel, low intensity section, they are all within the health guidance caution zones, but none of them exceed it. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, because of that real world propulsion being about 60 minutes a day, our short obstacle course um, can be assumed to be um, a day's worth of vibration if that were in the real setting and not just in the lab mobility course. 
So after we collect all this data, we move into our stats. Um, so far we have 13 subjects. So data collection is ongoing. Um, we're running a repeated measures ANOVA on it using the RMS and VDV average values across each of those three trials per wheel type per participant. Um, and on the following slides, I'll be displaying the RMS values. However, um, the VDV had the same outcomes and that's just, if anyone's interested in that, just let me know, I have the charts for you later. But um, we're testing by both wheel type and intensity type. And both of those surveys that I had referenced earlier are also gonna be evaluated for the differences in wheel type. So the first one we're gonna get into is the backrest position. Um, these charts I'm gonna show you, the X axis is the low, moderate and high intensity sections. And then the Y axis is the RMS values. So um, as you can see visually, and also it was statistically significant, but there was a difference in intensity. Um, as you can see, the low to medium to high, it's a very obvious increase. And then um, there was no statistically significant differences for the wheel type. Um, however, you can see it a little bit. It was trending towards significance for the loop wheel. Um, it's a p-value of 0 0.099, so not quite, but something to watch as we collect more data. Um, and oh, I forgot to mention the white is a standard wheel, the blue is the CLX wheel, and the gray is the loop wheel. So you can see it's kind of decreasing as you add the suspension elements, but it was not significant. Our next two sensor positions had the same results, so that's why they're here together. That is the seat plate and the footrest. Um, they were both also statistically significant differences in intensity type, um, but neither of them were significant differences in wheel type. So that's following the same as the backrest. Um, however, there was not much of a trend on these. Um, so something to keep looking at as we collect more data for sure. For those surveys, um, the visual analog scale that goes over each obstacle, um, I ran a repeated measures ANOVA with those 13 subjects and there was also no significance between the wheel types. Um, and then again, for the Likert, Likert survey per wheel, um, again, repeated measures ANOVA using the medians just because of a skew in the data, but there was also no significance between wheel types there. Getting into some of those results, just an overview, intensity was significantly different for each sensor position in both RMS and VDV, um, and the postdoc showed the low was the lowest, moderate in the middle, and high had the highest RMS and VDV values, um, and the wheel type was not significantly different. However, it was trending towards significance for that backrest sensor position in both the RMS and VDV. And then, as I just said, the qualitative, neither comfort surveys showed a significant difference in the wheel types. So getting into some of the discussion, the lack of significant differences in vibration values between those wheel types, the standard CLX and the loop wheel, has been seen in other studies in wheelchair vibration and suspension. So we think this may be due to, in our case, the combination of obstacles into the low, moderate, and high intensity sections instead of evaluating by individual obstacle. Um, if we were to evaluate by individual obstacle, um, we think there may be differences over certain types of intensity and different things like that. So maybe one wheel is better in the curb drop, but combining it with that gravel board is affecting its significance and um, kind of muddying that data a little bit. So something for us to look into. And then the increased propulsion force when using the loop wheels has also been seen in another study. Um, when you use the suspension wheels because of the springs, the users do lose some of their um, pushing force. And so that can definitely affect opinions of the wheel, especially if it's your first time ever using it. And then some of our participant feedback because those surveys uh, also had some note room for comments and notes like that. So um, multiple participants noticed that there was a difference in the loop wheel without knowing which wheel it was. Um, we've heard that it was springy or that their body didn't feel the jolt when they went over the curb drop, which is always a great thing to hear. And um, however, there were some complaints in the comments about the different wheel um, makeups and how each wheel had slightly different um, mechanics and how they were farther away from the um, from the wheel or they were the push rims were slightly different. They all had standard push rims. However, the attachment styles were a little different between a tab mount or the um, the screw on. So things like that can affect the opinions on the comfort surveys as well. Um, and we are continuing this work. We are continuing data collection. Participant testing is ongoing looking for a total of 30, so almost halfway there. 
And after this in-lab portion of the testing, the participants get to take home a set of loop wheels to test for a 12-week portion. And during this, we collect two weeks worth of the accelerometer and gyroscope data with sensors attached under the seat plate and on the wheel, respectively. We're using this to compare the whole body vibrations during times of propulsion, propulsion and non-propulsion to see um, how many of these daily vibrations are being experienced um, just from everyday life, like being in a car or something like that, and then what is from actually propelling over different surfaces. Um, along with these sensors on their chair and using the wheels for 12 weeks, they're given some comfort and pain surveys every two to three days so we can compare um, these whole body vibrations before and during using these loop wheels um, through both user opinion through the surveys and then through the RMS and VDV values we're gathering from those sensors. So that's all I had for you all today. Um, thank you for coming in. If you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks.